asked mom, I was like, mom, I need the piano for a photo shoot and it's going to be shot outside. And she's like, oh, okay, that's fine. And I said, but you won't get the piano back. And she's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, we're doing a creative thing. Like, I, I just want to basically create art out of this. I'm sitting on it, but as you look through the booklet, we smash it up, we bury it. It's the piano. A, that's a yes. tough sell. Yeah, <laughs> but I don't tell her this because she would always say no. This is Start at the Storefront, the podcast where we talk to business owners and entrepreneurs about the untold challenges of scaling a business. Today's guest is Van Anne Nguyen, a world-famous pianist, composer, producer, and wine connoisseur. Throughout this episode, you'll hear some of her music, including our theme song, which she and her double-touch partner, Mark Olson, composed and recorded for us. Listen in as we cover everything from how she used crowdfunding to finance her first album, what most musicians get wrong, and how she envisions her next big career move to involve something straight out of a sci-fi movie. Now, back to the episode. We're here with Van Ann, amazing concert pianist and good friend of the podcast. Typically, we're talking to startups launching their retail or manufacturing, but in talking to VA and some of our other friends in music, um, they have to literally get a venue. And then once they have the venue, the question is, what do they do from there? And so VA has played at almost, tell them a little bit about where you've played all over the world. I mean, I've played in big scale venues like the Sydney Opera House, for instance. No big deal. Yeah, just brush it off your shoulder. <laughs> it's, it's my backyard. So, <laughs> um, And then through to like, I don't know, the, the Forbidden City Concert Hall in China, through to like the small, small chamber music uh, halls in Vienna, uh, you know, the Schubert Hall, for instance, where there's so much history and so incredible natural acoustics, um, to very, very small venues like a jazz club or um, recently a warehouse in downtown LA where literally it is the bare bones and you need to bring everything in. That's one of the things that I wanted to bring up today. And I'm glad that you brought it up because Take us through the process of that, because you guys did everything for that. I mean, it was about as hands-on as, as you could make it, and you pulled it off. And so, like, <laughs> what was what was like the, the process behind that? So, Ronnie, the singer that I was working with, um, she found the venue. Uh, I think she'd already been there once before. And for us, when we're doing a concert, the first thing that is the most costly one is venue, but two is the piano. Mm -hmm. Moving a piano in and out and hiring the piano is so insanely costly. So when you find a venue that will already house a piano, that has it there already, it's like a big win. So we've cut that cost already. The venue itself was not that expensive, so we're like, okay, perfect. But then we start the promotions. Uh, we bring our own sound guy in. We had a bar, so we had to set up that bar. We had to go and buy the alcohol. We had to design the flyer. How do you decide how many people? So, so for me, if I'm doing quick math and I know nothing about music or venues, I'm thinking I have seats. I have to sell the seats. Yeah. So I would imagine your first step is, okay, based on this market and the people I might know in it and my reach, Yep. I need to get X yep. amount of seat, right? Is that kind of the logic? Exactly. So you want to find a venue that that particular venue was a capacity of 100. Okay. And we were comfortable with that number with the reach between myself and Ronnie and doing something that's a little different to what most people would normally be used to seeing. And quick, right? It was like a month out or not even. How long yeah. did you give it? it was... I would say, yeah, I would say four weeks, four or five weeks Okay. from the go ahead with the venue to putting out the word, mm -hmm. selling tickets on the venue. And you have bike. to prepay. So you find your venue. Do you yeah. pay them first? You pay them 50%. Oh, 50 percent of the, of the total. And then the other 50 percent is based on sales or something. There is a guarantee fee. That venue was four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you pay them twenty hundred, two hundred up front. So you pay them two hundred up front. Okay. But eventually you're going to have to pay the four hundred anyways. Right. That's right. regardless. But mm -hmm. that's just to like secure your spot. Yeah. Then you pay the other bit later on. Then you make four hundred for yourself. Once you hit their four hundred, you get your four hundred. That's eight hundred. Anything beyond that, we do an eighty twenty split. Oh, okay. Let's rewind the tape. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. So, so you you're saying the venue costs four hundred. Yes. Okay. In this example, let's just make it a thousand. Make it simple. Okay. All right. So I I pay a thousand dollars. 
that's how much the venue costs. Mm-hmm. I give them 500 up front. Mm-hmm. Then what happens next? So then I got to sell tickets. What's- yeah, basically you need to sell tickets. Let's just say the whole venue costs a thousand dollars. Doesn't matter where you, whether you pay up front or not. It's just going to be a thousand dollars. Okay. Then you make a thousand dollars, or you try to make a thousand dollars. But you haven't made any money yet because you haven't sold anything. No. Okay. So at this point, basically, you're trying to make two thousand dollars. One to cover their costs and one to cover your cover yours. yours. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then after that, that's when they'll cut into the ticket sales. But they are, is that industry standard, or is that something that unique to this venue? Um, it is, uh, I would say it's industry standard for any sort of buyout of a space. Okay. okay. So if you're seeing it, another jazz club, there's plenty around here in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. They will do 70-30 splits, 80-20 splits. Um, sometimes it's just a split and not a venue hire at all. So when you're looking at venues and whatnot, you mm-hmm. really do have to do some math to figure out price of the venue and is it worth it yeah. can can we seat enough people in this venue yeah. to compensate for the cost and the split that correct. is inevitable correct and then also you would consider is the venue like are you trying to reach other people like patrons that would normally go to that venue right is is that something that you want to counter in or is it just you're purely doing it for your people mm-hmm. people that you know will come and support you so that's also another thing to, to consider. Um, like, for instance, we have another show coming up and that venue is renowned for having incredible people come through. So they, like people who come through LA will be like, oh, we want to go look at live music. Let's see what this venue has. And they'll look at the calendar on their website. And okay. so that's another approach of it. How are, you, how are you deciding ticket price? Is it more of like, okay, so, so I can imagine it like some of it's marketing. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so every venue you're getting people to come. So maybe you're saying, I don't want to make too much money here because maybe it's a city you've never been to. Yes. And so then you just want to grow your brand. Right. How do you then decide? So if you have a hundred, in, in this case, a hundred tickets. Yeah. What makes you decide the price of it? I would say for a general concert entry for like a, a jazz venue, your normal entry would be twenty dollars, a twenty dollar cover charge. Okay. Yeah, like you're going to a club, it's twenty dollars. Like, okay, right. That's your base rate. Like anywhere in LA, you just want to see live music, twenty yeah. bucks. Got it. Okay. Like, I think comedy's in a similar space as well, but unless you're you've got a name, right? Say you're Seth MacFarlane, he's not going to charge twenty dollars. Right. Right. So then that's a completely different story. But I would say twenty is your base rate. The way we did it with that particular show was we wanted. Uh, people to enter with a glass of wine so we would charge an extra five dollars in the total ticket price okay yeah but the creative thing here is that you didn't you didn't necessarily hire a bartender you guys did it yourselves yes which is great you saved some money we saved some money yeah but then you get to pick a wine which is probably better than the wine any other bar yes. might bring in anyway. yes and then you'd find the deals it was fun finding the wine the unfortunate thing about that is your wine release came afterwards. Correct. In a perfect world, you could have had that being served right outside. Exactly. Ideally, that is that is the dream. That is the goal. Yeah. <laughs> Serving your own wine. But, um, Upcoming yeah. concerts yeah, down yeah. the line. Down the line, exactly. If you don't mind, like, take us back to when you were just starting out. How did you navigate this whole process? What was your your method for learning about all of this uh, fee scheduling and, and marketing? To be honest, it was trial and error from the beginning. My mom would always say like, you shouldn't wait for people to offer you a show. Because when I grew up, I grew up very classical. The classical mold is that you go and you compete in competitions. You compete so that in the first prize, second prize or third prize, offerings that offer you maybe two years of concert engagements in certain festivals around the world. They offer you a album release, maybe with a very small label. It, will, it would never be with a, you know, a big time Sony Universal or anything like that, but it's smaller. So you're trained to think that way. Like if you don't win, there's no other way. And you're trained to think that you should be winning these things around the age of 21 to 25, if not a little younger. So the norm is you winning your way into engagements, yes. not actually setting up the function. So there's really, there's a lot of musicians that probably don't even know what that's like. Yeah. And then, and then they think they're a failure if they don't 
right because they've never been a part of it because they've never won. Yeah. That's fascinating. <laughs> it's an awful, depressing feeling. Like you are there preparing two and a half to three hours of music for five rounds. Your two preliminary rounds, your quarterfinals of 40 minutes, your semifinals with a chamber music, your, your finals, a concerto of 45 minutes long. And you get cut at quarters. I kind of love that. In a weird way, like, I feel <laughs> like brutal. more more of life should be kind it's, of like that. It's very like cutthroat. So, how did your mom? I, I get like, what was the the nugget of information she learned at some point where she said, to your point, you gotta you gotta do it yourself. Well, I had an opportunity to play a concert. I think I was eighteen. I had an opportunity to play a concert in a uh, in Vietnam mm-hmm. with an orchestra. She's like, well, just set up the mic. The microphones are there. Let's just do a live recording and you can release it as an album, as a live concert recording. I like, well, yeah, why not? And so just from there, it became a almost like routine to go, oh, well, next year I'm going to do a concert. I may as well record it. And I'm preparing for the concert. So I'm playing at a level where I can just go in and record. Like it shouldn't be any different. Of course, it's expensive to the whole recording process, hiring recording studios, producers, all of that sort of stuff. So I, I did a Kickstarter at one point. I uh, we'll talk talk about that. You know what what was your goal? How much did you raise? And what were you able to put that towards? So this particular album right here, the Tonality album, this was in done in two thousand and twelve. You know, the, my first album was a purely classical album, and I was fine with that but in 2012 I was you know dabbling with the crossover genre and it was also me trying to work out who I was personality wise I'm I would never consider myself I don't know I always felt a little different to the stereotypical classical musician who uh is in their practice room six to eight hours a day every day like I I just can't I, I don't I go crazy I'll do four hours a day, very happily so. And I think it's more about the hyper focus of practice rather than, you know, sitting there going over and over. Anyways, that's besides the point. So then we get to Tonality 2012. The process, I got, basically got as many friends as I could to help me out. First of all, the photographer, the designer of the dress, the piano that I'm sitting on is uh, the very first grand piano my parents bought for me in 1990. And when I asked mom, I was like, mom, I need the piano for a photo shoot and it's going to be shot outside. And she's like, oh, okay, that's fine. And I said, but you won't get the piano back. And she's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, we're doing a creative thing. Like I, I just want to basically create art out of this. I'm sitting on it, but as you look through the booklet, we smash it up. We we bury it. It's the a, piano. That's a yes. tough sell. Yeah, <laughs> but I don't tell her this because she would always say no. Yeah. So I was just like, you just won't get it back, but I'll buy you another one. I'll replace it. Ooh. And she's like, oh, okay. And then she was really unhappy with it in the end. But then I said, look, mom, I'm preserving it, the piano. It was like getting too old anyway. So, you know, you're preserving it in art. So that was the art album artwork process. The recording process itself, as I'm writing all of this music and I go, okay, I need a, a string quartet, I need horns, I need this and this and this, all of that adds up. And how do you record 10 tracks in three days? Because every day costs at least $1,000 in the recording studio for a mate's rates, small studio in Sydney. And so I did the Kickstarter. And at the time, I feel like Kickstarters were kind yeah, what of Yeah, what year? What year was this? 2012. Yeah, I would say they were pretty new then. It was very fresh. Um, yeah. And it was just a stab in the dark. I didn't really know where it would go uh, and the power of... Did of they have a team? Crowd. So I know now Kickstarter and WeFunder, they have a lot of people that yeah. help people like you raise money did they have a team at the time or was it pretty bare bones no it was literally like two guys yeah and i yeah. didn't use uh kickstarter as the brand i used another another uh, platform called possible here is it ible okay so we just kind of put it together and posted it up and i post up on facebook and sent out email blasts so within the first day i think my goal was to raise like ten thousand because i figured the album will probably cost 
around there. This was a figure that you had just kind of had floating around in your mind, but you hadn't necessarily done I all did, the math. I did and, not do the math. Were you thinking okay. like 10 days of studio time at $1,000? I was day. like three days of studio time, 3000 Plus hiring all the musicians and the photographer. And yeah, everything. and like honestly, so many musicians there gave their time for free to record because they believed in the project. And uh, same thing, photographer, I, I think I housed him at my house, but uh, it was just like, yeah, we'll shoot, we'll do a creative collaboration. Everyone was keen to throw their two cents worth in. So they were like, this is a cool idea. The dress, that designer, he made that dress on me in the fields and That's stitched cool it into me. And then uh, we shot, and then I was like, how do I get out of this? And he just cut it, and it's, that's it. There's no more dress. That's the, that dress that is the existed. only evidence yeah. of that dress ever existing. Yes. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it, it was crazy. We were we had no plan. Like I, we had a vague idea, but we had no plan. And I feel like my life is like that sometimes with the, the music and where it leads is that I have an idea, but I'm just kind of, you're not trained to think logically so much sometimes. So did, did you meet, so you sent out the emails, did you end up meeting the goal? Yes, yes, yes. We, we hit the goal. Um, and how long, how long did it take you to, to hit it? I don't really remember. Because today I feel like the typical, like it's like three to six months, a lot of these campaigns that they, these people run. Usually oh, really? it's like millions of, or not millions, but it could be like $200,000. Right, right. And so it's like three to six months usually is the... I think uh, it was 30 days. I gave it 30 days. A month, yeah. Yeah, I gave it 30 days and then we hit it maybe three weeks in because it was like a hike in the first week, a lull in the second, and then the third, we kind of pushed it again and then it was fine. So we went over over it and it reached... The, the greatest thing about it was at the time, again, I didn't realize, but it, it reached particularly the Vietnamese community all around the world. I'm talking Vietnamese community, obviously Australia and the United States, Canada, I didn't realize uh, it, it got there. Um, obviously, back in Vietnam, in Italy, it reached over there. And then I subsequently ended up doing a concert for them as an exchange for their donations. I didn't realize the power of it at the time. I just thought, I'm just going to raise the money. And then it was a perfect marketing tool for it to come out soon after. Part of the package was that we basically, if people donated money, they would be able to come to the album release, which was at the Opera House. That's a oh, nice that's little cool. yeah, uh, that's a privilege game. that they got. Yeah, and it was like for them a no-brainer. I think it was like $150. The was. one thing that I'm coming back on is it sounds like these venues are actually pretty vacant. Like they're available. I don't know that I would have guessed that out of the gate. Like if I'm thinking like I got I want to play at the Opera House, let's mm-hmm. say me today, mm-hmm. and I decide, mm-hmm. and I call them. Yeah. In my head, it's kind of like a wedding venue where they tell you, yeah, they're booked for two years straight, especially it somewhere is. like the Opera House. It is. I did a launch on a Sunday, um, so that's generally like an off day. Got it. Okay. But at the same time, it's doubly expensive to move cannabis on that day. Yeah, right. So things like that I didn't realize. And so when they said, oh, yeah, the bill for moving the piano and tuning it is like $2,000. <clears> Those added costs. Like that, that whole album launch ended up costing like $30,000. Wow. So I was well and truly, yeah, I just didn't calculate it. So once, once you've got the album recorded, you've got the cover shot and you've got the album launched at the opera house, Mm -hmm. what comes next? I mean, you put it out on every streaming service. I'm imagining you're selling CDs. Was it like received well right away? Meaning like, was it an instant hit or did you really have to like still push your name out there? That particular album, I just, uh, we kind of just did the launch and I just wanted product to take to gigs to sell, like merchandise. And I think that's the, that's the best way, uh, the instant impact, you know, people watch the show and they're like hyped and they're excited. So then they want to take something home. And that purely for me was, was it, the, the getting your music onto online platforms was not even on the radar for me at that point in time. That came maybe like two years, three years later, where I was like, okay, we need to chart. We need to, how can we get that traction going? But again, it was like baby steps to get there. I I didn't think about that until Crossfire. Crossfire was the, yeah, piano and cello album where we did a couple of covers of top 40 songs and they ended up getting into the charts, the classical charts. And I was like, wait, this is great. 
how did we do that? Again, there's no there's no manual that's going to say, oh, sell 50 copies and you're going to get number 80. So when I released this album with uh, Universal and Decca, they have a roster of what's coming out. And so they then slot you in a time where they think would be beneficial for you and beneficial for them too. We don't have that information when we're releasing by ourselves. The day Do you agree with them the whole time? Or is it a big... I don't want, is it like, um, I can imagine it being, this is what you want, this is what yeah. they want, and then you have to compromise or enlighten them? Or It's been great so far in terms of um, content, like what I want to play and what I want released. Mm -hmm. Definitely, it's been great. Um, in terms of the timing of releases, that's still a work in progress, for, I think, the, for both sides, because we released this in January, which I thought would be would have been great. There's not much going on, like not much going on after Christmas. But at the same time, most people are away; they're on vacation and in Australia. That is. When did you finish the album? So. Oh, this album was finished back in April last year. Before I before I signed, it was about to. This is why I have this one because I thought it was going to independently release it. And that's Pop Alchemy. That's Pop Alchemy, the OG. Like, yeah. Uh, so there's nine months that goes. Well, the nine months uh, was due to their release. But they do singles in between, right? Is that yes. what happened? Okay. okay, so the singles idea is really, really interesting that you bring it up because in the classical world, we don't release singles. But they just, it's not a thing. You release albums. And so when they said, oh, look, we can't release you until January, I'm like, that's crazy. I won't have any content for nine months. That's not possible. Which affects like everything you do, right? Your Instagram. Oh, yeah. You can't tell people. You can't release anything. Right. And when, when everything is there, the, the 10 songs are there. And so I then proposed the dropping singles every couple of months, every two months was what we did. So we dropped the first single in August, the second in October, and the third just before the December. I'm shocked that they had never considered that before. And same thing with videos. Music videos for classical is like... Don't exist. Almost don't exist. Like usually there'd be a live recording of a concert or something, but not an actual music video. That is a very, very new concept for the classical world. It actually makes a lot of sense. No, well, I, I would imagine that YouTube has helped bring it to the masses. Like you can you can do that now because now you have a platform with which to view it. Because like, think about it. Back in the day when MTV was playing music videos, uh -huh. they would have <laughs> laughed at you and be like, oh, can you put this classical video on? Yeah, yeah. Like, no, no that wouldn't have been their, that right. their MO at all. Uh -huh. But now there's clearly a market for it. Yeah. Because you've got some massive acts putting stuff out on YouTube. Yeah. And they're getting millions and sometimes tens or hundreds of millions of views. Yeah. So do they... On the video, they, they didn't help you with the video, did they? Or no, so the video was... So you do it yourself? Yes. Yeah. They were distributed. They got me a Vivo channel, which I'm really pretty legit now. Yeah, and that's Vivo cool. artist. So Universal helps you. You guys do the single thing, or you release your singles. Mm -hmm. Album launches. In terms of... So you're done in April. This happens nine months later. Mm -hmm. When do you go back to making new music? And And... All of this doesn't seem like a distraction because it all seems like scheduled. It's all scheduled. So you know when it's coming. Yeah. Do you go right, a right away into music or do you take some time off? What, how do you navigate so what's next? I think for any recording artist, it is then the, the balance of doing live shows. To spread the word about the album and the music that you just made. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And to live, make money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and exercise your, your craft. For me, I there's nothing better in this world than performing, being on stage. Like I love recording, but to be honest, I, I hate the recording process. I don't like being in that room. Everything inside just tightens up and goes, okay, I need to play perfect. How do you do that? You can't. No, you can't. I thrive on like the adrenaline of, of uh, live performances. Because you can feel the people, their reaction. Yeah, you feel the people the when you're like excited. Recording, I just, I yeah. freeze. I start to freeze up. And then as you, you make a mistake and you're like, oh, shoot, I, I need to do that again. And you tense up even more and it just gets worse and worse. How many people are on the other side of the glass watching you? Probably two. Okay. 
Very so that's not really the issue. No, no, yeah. it's not them. It's an internal thing. It's, it's just me. Uh, and some people, I know other pianists who are so on it for recording and hate the live aspect. They can't deal with the nerves of playing live. But in today's world, that's yeah. got to be your bread and butter. Yeah. So that's a very um, occupational hazard. Of yeah. Sorts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But some famous, famous uh, pianists are, are just they just can't deal with it. But I I I uh, I think the live aspect for me, coming back to performing with Ronnie in that warehouse, for instance, there is an energy you can never recreate again, because of the people who are in it. The lighting, all those variables can create the perfect moment, even if there are imperfections. And I mean, the space was a DIY space. We had 80 people in there. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't Carnegie Hall, but would that have been better? I'm, I'm not sure for that moment in time, the energy of, of how people reacted was the coolest thing. Well, I'd like to shift gears into the wine because I'm curious oh, yeah. about like I want to I want to hear how do you go from making music <laughs> to making wine? Well, I have one. I've always loved wine. My dad introduced me to wine when I was 12 years old. What's mm -hmm. the drinking age in Australia? Wow. <laughs> I think you just What's sold the your statute dad out? of limitations on that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so drinking age is 18. But um, what would happen would be uh, mum would be teaching at home. She'd teach three families. And uh, they would basically take the whole afternoon and evening up. They, each family had two or three kids, so it would just take the entire Friday afternoon through the evening. The three dads would then each bring a bottle of red wine and just do tastings. And so I'd, I'd uh, kind of teach a little bit and then um, come over and dad's like, here, taste this. And, you know, I think for red wine, it's very quiet. It's not when you start drinking, it's not something that you're like, oh, I love this. So that is why I say dad introduced me to wine and then I grew to love it. I then also felt I've always had this fascination with music, with light, with trying to make it a sensory experience. So I didn't want it just to be an audience member comes and listens to you, like listens to you play. That's, that should not be it. It should be how you look on stage what you wear is very important in how it would translate to the audience, like of who you are, your personality. It should that should matter as well. Mm -hmm. But in the classical world, traditionally, you would just be in blacks. You'd be in tails for the guys. Uh, you'd be in like a nice gown or something like that. So no real personality showing through because it's a standard uniform of sorts. Yeah. Oh, I, I guess. Like, I mean, the 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 personality would be like, oh, she's wearing a red dress, but it wasn't anything like flamboyant or I don't know. I just feel like people didn't make statements out of it. And I, I wanted to do that. From then, the, the wine came in because I started to do wine pairing concerts. I had this crazy idea of wanting to pair music to how wine tasted. So dependent on the body and the flavors, the tannins, um, I would then choose a piece which I thought reflected that, but in sound. And what we eventually did, uh, Ian from Smith Devereux, he was the first crazy person to kind of understand, he understood the idea. He was, he also is a musician, um, but he makes wine and he said, yeah, let's do this. So we did it in Sonoma five years ago. He brought his wines. We did five different types. We started with bubbles. And with bubbles, I paired like a, a light Chopin waltz to go with it because it's, it's light as a dance. And, and then we went on to whites, onto Pinot Noirs, onto bold reds. And, and that's basically, if you think about a concert, you kind of build it that way too. Mm -hmm. You start with something kind of exciting and then you, it has more depth and so on. So for me, it's, it's, it makes sense. And so from there, your partnership kind of morphed into, well, why don't we create a wine specifically, like instead of using someone else's label or type of wine, yeah. like, let's, let's create our own. Yeah. And so how does that partnership uh, look? You're not stomping grapes yourself, but you're obviously, I mean, you probably like put to. in a lot of input <laughs> to this wine. So how do you 
How did you go about that? Yeah, so essentially, um, this first one it was for me a quite hands off approach um, because of the timing of me being in different places around the world and the timing not working out very well. But I said, you know, I would love my first wine to be a big bold red as like an homage to dad introducing me to wine. So we said, yeah, we'll do, if, if the grapes are coming from, from Napa, we'll do a Cabernet Sauvignon. And so that's what they did. They would send tasters to me and I would taste them and then we'd say yes, no, yes, no. And then it was a fun process. <laughs> I would imagine so. Yeah. And then um, I was here for the bottling process. So we used a facility out of one of, the, one of their friend's vineyards and they hand bottled we, we only did a small run of 10 cases, but we hand bottled them, which was super cool to, to be a part of as well. And then label-wise, I had a lot of say with that. So I had a friend back in Australia, and we sat down and we designed the label. And it's kind of similar in the respect of designing a album cover. Of course, you probably don't want your face on it, but, <laughs> um, but uh, I wanted it to have some sort of piano uh, connection to it and then sort of, you know, fireworks that sort of. I, I like to think of myself and my playing and, and how you have a good time with wine. So that's how the label came about. Will you be doing more wines with the same group? Is this just the beginning? What do you... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It was so fun. I, I mean, I learned a lot as well. Um, just little things like the labels, uh, like how that goes about, like the teams that they work with, the, the corks that they use, uh, where the bottles come from, all those other things. It's just like, like so similar to creating an, an album, the process, just different nuances. But yeah, for sure. Eventually, I would love to have an array of wines where I can then pair with food. What's interesting about this whole thing to me is that you are now, like this is another arm of revenue for you. Yeah. You know, you are a musician by trade. Like I'd say that that seems like your primary focus, but mm -hmm. this could shape out to be just as lucrative as music, right? I haven't music. quite thought that far. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I haven't thought that far. I just thought it'd be, it was the right timing to come out with a wine of your own, considering I've been pairing wines for five years now. Just a natural progression yeah. towards that. And, and it wasn't forced. It literally, I, I had this conversation with Ian and he said, yeah, come up to Napa. We have this great tasting room. Uh, you should do a gig here. We haven't done a gig in a while. And so I went up there, did some tastings, and he does an artist series with a couple of other singers and songwriters. And I just kind of toyed with the idea and said, what's, what's the possibility of getting a Van Ann wine? He's like, let's do it. Okay. Seems like a no-brainer. Yeah, it was, the launch was so much fun to have, you know, an in, again, an intimate amount of people there, but knowing that they're there to support the music and the yeah. artist. Why, what do you think most musicians get wrong about either growing their brand? So, frankly, it sounds brand? like... Brand? There's no brand. They don't think brand. No. You've, you've, your whole construct is you have to win to, to play. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. So you have a lot of probably defeated musicians out there by, no, by nothing other than losing or not having won these venues. Yeah. And so it sounds like you've escaped all this in some interesting way, which I find fascinating. Let me backtrack. I, I say compositions, this is from a piano perspective. Right. From, say, string players, uh, they also, a lot of them will follow that as well. But, of course, a lot of them have goals to join orchestras. Okay. And uh, prestigious orchestras around the world. So, again, it's an audition process. But, like, how often is an orchestra going to offer a spot? And then everybody in the world goes for that spot. And is that lucrative, playing in an orchestra? It's stable. Um, it, dependent on the orchestra you're in, and where you are in the orchestra, where first desk, second desk, so on, your principal player, you lead the section, but it's, it's stable. It's, it's a full-time job. You yeah, have you're touring, patient. I imagine. Sometimes you may tour, but you have locked in dates with your home concert hall, right? So some musicians cannot deal with being locked in. They don't like that idea. And for them, Joining an orchestra is the worst possible thing ever. But for other other musicians, that is the dream. It's the dream, yeah. Right. So it's again, it's a personality thing. If you like stability, if you like, uh, I, don't, I don't know, and and because you you're locked in, you know, when you can have vacation time, 
you can teach on the side, you can... So the orchestra is like the... Nine to five. Essential, <laughs> but, but, but like the high-placed nine to five corporate America. Yeah. Safe, stable, you're good. Yeah. But you're talented. There's still, there's a certain talent level there. Absolutely. And you would put yourself as like the, the renegade entrepreneur in the music world. <laughs> figuring it out figuring it out yeah <laughs> <laughs> definitely trying to figure it out do you have to do a certain amount of albums with the universal deal like are you how does that work are they i signed three albums in. okay and this is one right yes. okay so now you're working on the second one yes when are you expecting that to come out share it here first tell everyone. yeah <laughs> um it'll be 2020 for sure okay have you written all the songs uh, we've got or? um we've got the concepts so i've got two album concepts and it's just narrowing it down to working out which one we're going to go with and then i need to sit down and write an album concept what does that even mean so the album concept like for instance pop alchemy what what is pop alchemy it is an album entailing of mashups of classical and pop songs yeah as well as a couple of top 40 covers done on the piano so album concept um could be a whole covers album of the beatles is that what it is? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be pretty cool, though. <laughs> Can you tell us? You can't tell um, us? No. Yeah. Give us, give us, is it like a cab time. or is it like a champagne? How would we describe the next Yeah, parrot, parrot. Yeah, parrot. Parrot? parrot. Like Pinot. I'm going to go slight Pinot. <laughs> <laughs> is that what it is? Well, you had a full-bodied red for this one, so. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny because, to be honest, this, uh, this wine is, is a lot more body and guts than... The album. The album, because the album is quite fun. Mm -hmm. Not that red wine can't be fun, but this is a serious drinking wine. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I I think along the same nature, I it would be it would be a fun album, but just a little. So like a Franzia, a bagged wine. <laughs> <laughs> I can't disclose too much because right. it may not end up going that way, and you'll be like, what? <laughs> We'd like to thank Franzi, our sponsor, <laughs> for this segment. The finest in boxed wine. Yeah. <laughs> Some people slap it. It's a thing. What would you give? Adv what advice would you give to up and coming musicians? Or let's say I'm a musician. I'm super talented. Yeah. Right. I I don't know if I have it yet. I'm probably afraid, frankly, to do my own venue, do my own thing. Failure is tough. But I'm like that talent level. What would I tell them to do? I would tell them to record as much as you can and use all the platforms that are available to you and just put everything out there. Like everything. Like Spotify, yeah. all the social I mean, media. Yeah, it's so easy now. Like Spotify, exactly, Spotify, iTunes. You know, there are aggregates. Like we use, before I was signed, I used CD Baby. They are so good and they look after the royalty, the back end of it. You don't even need to, people are like, oh no, but what about, I'm doing a cover, or how do I get the royalties to the right? No, you, you look up that information, you write down the publishers, you write down the songwriters, they look after the rest of it. It's so easy these days. So, so you, you would focus on the product, focus on your content, your music, and then sharing it is, the, sharing is sort of the it? easy part. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's, that's the immediate part where it's not high risk. The right. risky part is then putting yourself out there and putting the show on. Sure. For me, what I'm seeing now is because all of this came most of it before the Instagram world started. All of your albums. And most of them. I'm yeah. old. So for me, it's interesting to sit here and, and look at it and, you know, try and build my Instagram following at the same time and trying to navigate that. Like, is it your content that's the most important? Are people watching you because of your personality? Particularly for musicians, because obviously there are just personalities out there. What do there. you think it is? For myself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think it's people follow you because of you or you because of your, your piano skills? I'm both. <laughs> <laughs> both. Yeah, both. Yeah. I donn't think I'm they sure would... the, the real classical people follow you too. They must. Yeah, In the music world, right? but the real classical people, I don't know if they're on Instagram. Oh, burn. Ooh. Well, sorry, guys. I don't know. You're probably not listening anyway, yeah, so. Right. <laughs> oh, age-wise, I guess. Again, like, now, sure. if I say, oh, real classical, I, I instantly, this, that's so scary that I'm like, no, instantly, they're older people. That's so bad of me. That is bad. That's really awful. But then, that's why I have Facebook, right? For the, for the old people. Right. For the old people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. I'm digging myself into the hole here. 
No, but that's why I ha you have to use all. That's hilarious. You have to, you have to use all your platforms. <laughs> that's why I'm on the newspaper. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was on the newspaper. <laughs> and I actually cherish newspapers. Like, I think newspapers are like... It's some of the best content because nobody yeah. expects it. And yeah. so if you can like, like handwriting a letter to somebody's it's way special. further today. That, yeah, it's special. Yeah. Exactly. Print is special. Yeah. Yes. So your advice is use all your social use media. Use all your social medias and then truly just take that risk. What terrible thing could happen to you? Like start small and then put a small show on and collaborate. Oh, yeah, collaborate. Find people that... With other musicians. Yes. Yeah, so that, that way you're sharing the risk. Exactly. You're all sort of sharing the courage required. Yeah. And don't be sense. afraid of the word no. Just ask. Who would say no? Lots of people. Like I would ask her, for instance, I'd ask for clothing sponsorship. Yeah. Like, hey, I, I need a dress. And what, what's the worst thing that could happen? They'd say no and go move to the next designer. And yeah, branding. What, what you said about branding, I think musicians are just not wired that way. And I wish they were. Because it doesn't matter how good you are, no one knows you if you're not out there. And that's a big problem. Sitting in your bedroom. It's interesting though, video, you know, like YouTube, they, they, have, they have that convention, VidCon. Yep. So I went to that a couple of years ago and it was fascinating to see. They had a live stage for their uh, music influences, hmm. the people who had the, their channels, right? Huge followings. But they're, they are kids, if I can say kids, like in their teens, they're in their bedroom just with a camera playing guitar covers to the camera and everyone at home is watching. They went up on that stage and they could not hold an audience because there is that much more space now that you need to fill as a performer. So for me, the lesson I learned from that is you need to perform. You need to be out there and performing and doing your craft out there. You can't just sit behind a screen because it's, I don't think that's performing at all. That's It's, it's so interesting because it is, vastly different right you know there's a comfort there exactly. of being in your room it's just your camera uh, if you make a mistake you can just re-record or whatever yeah. but if you if you're trying to hold someone's attention not just one person's but uh -huh. an audience of a hundred or a thousand you have to be larger much of a larger persona than you would be in just your bedroom the other word that comes to mind is consistency in terms of like discipline or in terms of practice uh, practice is obvious yeah that that should be a given but consistency of what you're putting out there. You know, for me, I get I get antsy that, you know, an album comes out once a year. I think that's not enough. But it is enough for me at this point in time because I need to tour it and I need to do my gigs. Then I need to find time to write it and then restart that process mm -hmm. again. Like, I think for an album to come together, it takes six to nine months at least. I look at it like momentum. You know, you, you need to, it takes time to build it. Yeah. But then once you have it, you have to keep it going. Yes. And stay in that space. Yes. And if you don't, it's mm. generally so much harder to start again. It's like you've been going to the gym every day. Now you've taken three months off and that first week is not ideal for anybody. And that's why I feel like I I am afraid of taking holidays. It probably is a great thing for me in terms of inspiring me again to write. I love new spaces and I love meeting different types of people and hearing different, uh, smelling different things and hearing different uh, languages. You know, those things always contribute to creating for me. But being away from the piano for three weeks, that's scary. <laughs> so what's next for VA? Well, hey, I'm gonna put it out there, right? Should do it. Let's just put it out there Let's because, talk about it. all right, so the idea is um, we do a virtual tour. Now, a virtual tour being that I stumbled across this Spirio modeled Steinway piano, which plays back. So you, you'll hit record on your iPad, you play whatever you want and then press stop, press play, and it will play back the keys moving. That playback uh, technology has been around for a while, but this plays back all your nuances it, to, the, to the staccato, to the crescendo, everything is there. So it's incredible. So if you push the key down halfway, it knows exactly where you left off and knows how yes. fast you came off. This is the next generation of player piano. Exactly. It is t incredible. And then you can go back into this, the app and adjust what you want as well. All within the app. Ooh. Yes. So if you suddenly like 
held your pedal down for too long, shorten that. It's like putting music production together with the live instrument now. It's, it, it's incredible. So you're not, you're going to save a lot of time in the editing suite. Sure. If you needed to edit, right? That's great. It is for amazing. The, for the recording, I would imagine too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So if you want to transpose the entire thing down in three tones, you can do that. I'm sure some musicians cheating. hate it. They're like, you're cheating. Oh, yeah. Right? But yeah. this is what I mean. It's saving you time now. If, for instance, you know, what I was saying about recording, like, oh, shoot, I pressed the wrong note. You are cheating and going back in to go click. Right. But it does save you time, right? Right. So that's only one aspect of what this piano is about. For me, the coolest thing is that because it is linked via Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, if there is another Spirio piano, in, for instance, I played it in LA, and there's a Spirio, same model, in Tokyo. You connect it, and I'm playing in Tokyo as well ah, at the same time. And this is when we add the hologram. This is when we add the hologram, so that VA can appear in 10 different cities at the same time. So if you're listening or watching, you know anything about holograms or you work for Steinway, <laughs> 2021 oh. is the tour launch date. 10 cities in one day. Diego is my tour manager, clearly. Yeah. Because <laughs> I he hasn't told me this, but... <laughs> no, I think it's really straightforward. It's pretty simple. And I think Steinway should and will be more than happy to sponsor it. The other concept is then you have one live person there, right? Exactly. So, you, so like we bring in a live person per, per uh, venue violinist, singer. To accompany you on the piano. The hologram. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, there is a live element to it. Right. Well, apart from me playing live, but there's a human there. Yeah. <laughs> a human element to it. No, well, I mean, we were talking about this idea the other day that if, I, if we were to start smaller in terms of staying within the state of California, right. I could then move down or up. And right. be like, let's do San Diego, let's do LA, and like two hours later, let's do Santa Barbara two hours later, you know. I'm excited about the idea, but know nothing about holograms and <laughs> that technology. If you think about pianos, nobody ever thinks about piano innovation. Those two things don't exist. It's almost like an oxymoron saying yes. it. And so if I'm Steinway, to me, this is a no-brainer. It's like, whoa, now, now the hologram just increases my marketability. But also what I'm selling is this new component, which is the Bluetooth piece with the app, yes. being able to tune it, however you described it. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know that they're marketing that to a, to a, to a mass. I mean, I don't even know how often people buy a new piano, but to me, it's a no-brainer. To them. me, that particular piano, because there is no compromise on quality either. Because That sounds like a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> How much is the piano? How much is it? It's one hundred and fifty-two thousand. And it's like a grand, you said, like a nine-footer. No, How much is a normal Steinway for comparison? So this Spirio is the size of a Steinway Model B, mm -hmm. which for me is the ideal piano size for any home because it's six foot ish. Okay. Because you can't have a nine foot in your house unless you've got a McMansion and the acoustics for it. It's, you know, right? It's like a dining table. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's for concert halls. But they do make the stereo in a D as well. With how big is a D? Nine foot. Okay. So, so it's six or nine. So the D is made for the, the concert hall too. And so how much would a, a, a regular B cost you? Uh, a regular B, brand new, is 112000 So it's, you know, significantly more expensive. I mean, it's what? 40000 $40,000 $40, more, yeah. yeah. I would argue if you're going to spend 112, you're exactly. right there. Just yeah. go for 152. You, yeah, yeah. You're, you're there. You're already there. Yeah. Ship it. To, Put it on the credit card. Yeah. To, to then have this technology and imagine like inviting someone over who you really like, who can play and you, you then capture that forever. You don't need to invite them back over. Oh. <laughs> Do you then need to ask permission? It's kind of like stealing your soul. Wow. Be like, hey, come over. I'll host a dinner party. Can you play for me? Okay. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> wow and then never talk to yeah. them again yeah. <laughs> That's a... and then now put the hologram in and she's there if Done. you want it there it's like Alexa play the piano <laughs> yeah. yeah look at that we just paired it now with Amazon oh. now you have a three way partnership between Steinway, Steinway. Amazon and, and the hologram company <laughs> this is some next level we are some real sponsor whores 
Real entrepreneurship. The yeah. thing is, this is all super possible in today's environment. That's kind of the exciting part. So after this concert, 2021, <laughs> by, then, by then you'll have another album launch for sure. Probably three albums in. Yeah, may- maybe that could be the third Universal album tour. Sure. Hologram tour. You should pitch this to Universal. I think, I, really I think it seriously has legs and, and it's super exciting and I possible. Really should. We have a great uh, festival in Australia called Vivid. Happens every winter in June, and it's a music, ideas, and light oh. festival, and it's incredible. They project stuff into the opera house. So know. they would do this. The, oh yeah. This would be up their alley. Yeah. Yeah. Just need to get people. Let's send some emails. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So for the people listening, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me at Vanan Official. V A N A N H Official. That's websites, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify. Apple Music. VA super talented. Thank you for being on. Thanks. Thanks super very good much. talking to you. We here at Start of the Storefront would love to hear feedback from you. Reach out and let us know what you think about the show. Make sure to give us a rating on iTunes. Anything over five stars is the only way to go. Our music is composed by Double Touch. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Start of the Storefront. For more information on the products and businesses featured on the show, check out the links in the show notes. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.